Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 19th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Uh, I would ask everyone in the room to ensure their mobile phones are on silent. It's acceptable to use uh, mobile devices uh, for social media, but please do not photograph or film proceedings. Uh, we have apologies this morning from Alison Johnson, and Ross Greer is subbing. Um, can I invite Ross to make any declaration of interest? Thanks for having me, convener. No relevant interest to declare. Thanks very much, Ross, and very welcome to the committee. Um, the first item on our agenda is subordinate legislation. We have one negative instrument to consider. That is the uh, National Health Service free, prescription pre free Prescriptions and Charges for Drugs and Appliances Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Could I invite any comments from members? No? Okay, that is agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item two is on the draft budget 2018-19, uh, and we have two evidence sessions today. Could I welcome to the committee Sharon Waring, Chief Finance Officer and Re Finance and Resources Officer, uh, SIPFA IGB CFO section. That's a big acronym, that one. Uh, Judith Proctor, Chief Officer, Aberdeen Health and Social Care Partnership. Julie Murray, Chief Officer, East Renfrew. Renfrewshire Health and Social Care Partnership and Councillor Peter Johnson, Health and Wellbeing Spokesperson at COSLA. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, we're going to move directly to questions. Could I ask you maybe to um, reflect on the uh, uh, budget situation that uh, partnerships are finding themselves in? If someone would like to begin. If we go alphabetically, and I'll maybe take a stab at that one. Um, it was one of the conversations we were just having uh, when we were outside. I think it's a very, very varied picture across Scotland. Uh, each of the health and social care partnerships started from different places. Uh, each of the health and social care partnerships have a, a different configuration of services delegated to them and obviously have different local circumstances in which, which we work. Uh, certainly from an Aberdeen City perspective, uh, we closed the year, uh, we managed to um, achieve a, a balanced budget overall and indeed posted a surplus in relation to the transformation funds, which was largely as a result of uh, our ability to spend that funding quickly. However, that funding has all been now allocated towards transformation uh, projects. Uh, it's a challenging position I think we find ourselves in this year but we are uh, working hard to achieve a balanced budget by the end of this uh, financial year. Yeah, happy to go next. Um, East Renfrewshire has a long-standing partnership. Uh, we have been integrated uh, since 2006, um, and we made management savings through integration fairly early on. Um, and I, as, as Chief Officer and previously Director, have been responsible for integrated budgets since 2007. Um, part of our difficulty is we've made we have we've made easy savings um, over the years. The the, the low hanging fruit. Uh, we're now getting to a stage where it's it's getting is getting much more difficult. Um, we do project to be on budget for seventeen eighteen, but we're using around nine hundred thousand pounds of reserves. And uh, like Judith, it was planned so that we could have. Um, a bit more time to create a transitional fund uh, to redesign and restructure, um, because we've, as I say, we've, the low-hanging fruit is gone. So we're having to look at customer pathways, patient pathways, looking at managing demand in different ways, and um, making savings through restructuring and looking at skill mix. So again, like Judith, we'll, we'll manage 2017-18 very concerned about future years given the the parent body's potential budget settlements are what they're projecting so uh so we're managing by the skin of our teeth at the moment but nervous for the future i'm quite happy to give you an update on the overall position um, across scotland very much um, as judith has actually said but each of the IGIBs, they have different um, delegated budgets to them. They are not all consistent. For example, some have children and families and homelessness within the delegated schemes. Um, others are just looking at adult services within what's been delegated to them. And there is a, a variety of... Uh, outturn position uh, across the country. Um, we're, uh, we go from one extreme where one of the partnerships has actually had to have a loan uh, from the local authority um, to assist in its financial position, which is due to repay pay back in future years, to others who have planned well and been able to deliver the savings targets and been able to look at uh, putting money into reserves, which they are all required to look at. 
in relation to our reserves policies that we should all have in place. So it is very much a mixed picture uh, across Scotland, um, with us all looking at um, significant um, savings and efficiency programmes uh, for the coming year, so that we will uh, maintain our balanced budgets uh, where possible going forward. Thank you. Colleagues, from a COSWA perspective, we would firstly argue that if you look at the credibility of the health and care budget, you can't look at it in isolation. We need to understand the detail of the budget, certainly, but we also have to understand the wider context within which it sits. The local government budget, from our perspective, is a key driver of preventative activity that seeks to address inequality and lower demand for other services across the system, including vitally our health and care system. We believe that, uh, from a COSWA perspective, Simply protecting the NHS, for example, while cutting local government budgets is counterproductive to our overall objectives and, as a country, to the objectives for health and social care in the longer run and will inevitably lead to more pressures being built up and more problems and more expenditure from the public purse in the longer run. We believe that, ultimately, investment in local government will also reduce demand for our health and care services. Um, and we accept that every government, local and national, has faced the same problem of funding the current service level, but also the shift in the balance of care that we are so desperate to achieve. So we would argue initially that we need to see a far greater focus on investing in services which deliver the best outcomes for our communities. A short-term input-focused budget process is actually, from our perspective, an inhibitor to genuine reform. We believe that IGBs need to be supported to obtain the maximum flexibility in their use of their budgets to meet the demands of their local communities, and we would argue that any new commitments must be fully funded, but the core budget needs to be sufficient also. Any funding additionality while significantly cutting the core just doesn't work. Thanks very much. Um, I think the COSLA paper is very good and uh, I think it's a robust paper and if we look at it, the summary in, of um, paragraph 5 is short-termism, centralisation and a lack of evidence, evidence base combined with budget cuts. Um, that, to, to me, seems to be the summary, but it's the bottom point, I think, and it's the point that Peter's just made, that reductions to core local government budgets with no cognizance of the interrelationship between all that local authorities do to reduce inequalities, build capacity and resilience uh, and assets and decrease demand for services in other parts of the system. That, that's, that is key because I, I, I would just like to hear from the panel as to whether in your area you are seeing the services being provided by the partnerships being impacted by the cuts to the core budget of local government. Because for me, that's where the front line in the fight against inequality is. So is that happening in your area? Are you seeing your services being impacted by that core budget reduction? Start off um, coming back in relation to the um, the budget settlement in relation to 1718 and what that impact was uh, across all partnerships. Um, there was an agreement for additional funding going into IGIBs uh, for, of 107 million. However, there was also an agreement of a budget reduction of 80 million across Scotland to the IGIB. So we did see um, a reduction in our services uh, that we had to. Uh, find uh, savings and efficiencies uh, to cover. And the funding that we're in um, was for the Scottish Living Wage, for uh, additional funding to waive the financial assessment for war pensions and to help uh, pre-implementation of the new carers funds. So it, it wasn't uh, money that was able to offset the savings challenge of the 80 million that we had to find. And that was on the local authority side. In relation to the health side, we had a flat cash a budget settlement and we did have a big debate about what flat cash meant but it was expected to be the budget that we had for 16-17 continuing with the IGIBs picking up the inflationary pressures that went along with that which included staffing pressures, other cost pressures and probably the biggest pressure that we faced was the prescribing budget. Uh, we were having to fund uh, the uplift in the prescribing budget, which last year uh, for a lot of the partnerships was around a 5% increase. And we actually, in Greater Glasgow Partnership, done a lot of work to try and reduce what 
across the six partnership was a 16 million pressure and we've put a lot of spend to save and a lot of work with the pharmacists to actually bring that back so that we are managing it within the existing budget that we had. But yes, there has been um, new funding went in, but there was also a requirement for partnerships to find significant savings to be redirected to fund uh, pressures that they had in the partnerships. From an Aberdeen perspective, um, we had to find 5.2 million um, in terms of inflationary pressures which we absorbed from, from the budget uh, and Aberdeen City Council took the decision to take the full share of the 80 million that they were able to, which meant that we had a, a further uh, set of savings to find to the tune of about 3.1 million, so that has been significantly challenging for us to find. Um, at the same time as trying to transform our services with, with the, the budgets there. Uh, for us, uh, of course, our thinking is now going into the budget setting for the, the, the coming financial year, uh, what decisions in terms of local government and indeed NHS budgets will, will mean uh, and the impact of that on the health and social care partnership. We're, we're, we're planning ahead prudently, but uh, until we know uh, the, the impact on budgets of our partner organisations, uh, we don't know the full extent of the challenges that we face. Yeah, happy to answer that. I mean, I suppose um, my first response is that council's core budgets are our core budgets. I mean, our, our council funds 45 million of our core budget, and that's on, on frontline services. And again, um, we had a significant savings to make um, uh, it, it last year. Uh, and, this, and this year, I think our saving total is 4.2 million. However, I have to say that, you know, just in terms of the inequalities and the sort of preventive work our council in East Renfrewshire has um, protected an element of money, which was the early years change fund, and that's money that we've been using across, the, we call it the East Renfrewshire family. Um, so that includes the um, Health and Social Care Partnership, the Culture and Leisure Trust, and the different council departments to try and focus on prevention in early years, and that is around housing, environment, um, nursery education, etc. So as I say, the council's core budgets are our core budgets. <laughs> so then, and so if any impact obviously has an impact on ourselves. Do you want to comment here, Peter? Well, I think from a causal perspective, the, the, the major issues in the 17-18 budget are threefold. There's the quantum. That's the core budget. Is it sufficient to deliver where we are uh, and current the day-to-day -day services? Is it sufficient to allow us uh, to fund transformation? And is it, do we have the flexibility to make local decisions that are best suited to the needs of local communities? Um, and as colleagues have said, I mean, the health and care budget is suffering from the same tensions as the local government budget, where there are significant questions over whether the quantum is appropriate to deliver the immediate needs of the day-to-day -day services. And the key question for us is, standing still is not good enough. Um, for us to meet the demographic challenges that are coming in our direction that everybody knows about, we can't afford to stand still. We have to move forward. We have to innovate. We have to find new ways of delivering services that best meet the needs of, of our people within the community. And that's the major challenge that we have with the budget. Just to summarise the answer t to your own questions is no, that, that not sufficient. It's not a case of yes or no. You have to look at the whole thing in the round. Um, I think we have major concerns about the budget being able to meet the ambitions that we have in health and social care. Colin. On to the panel. C can I ask a question about the way partnerships are funded and how this impacts on some of the challenges that you've commented on, in particular the fact that you're obviously funded by your two main constituent parts, local authorities and um, health boards. Uh, Julia, in East Renfrewshire's evidence, you say that this means that funding is not losing its identity. Could you explain what you mean by that? And for the rest of the panel, is is that something you agree with? Okay. Um, so clearly we get funding from our parent bodies. Um, and the, the intention is that funding, when it comes into the IJB, um, loses its identity. We decide on our strategic priorities and direct back to the council and the, um, and the health board. But I suppose for us, the, the challenge is um, that we have to continue reporting the spend through two different um, reporting systems. We have, at the margins, uh, you moved budget around. Um, I think my anxiety, uh, and I don't have evidence for this, but my gut feeling is that if we decided to significantly disinvest, for example, in social work, and decide we wanted to invest in physiotherapy, 
uh, I think I might have trouble persuading the council the following year to give me some additional funding to meet demographic pressures as they would think they were subsidising NHS budgets and potentially vice versa. Now, I don't have any evidence for that because we've not really tried it, but I, I, I don't, it doesn't feel to me like the funding is losing its identity in the way that was intended. I don't know if colleagues have got... Um, I would just like to add to what Julie's saying in that um, we are working with two ledgers um, and we are working with two sources of funding and we are having to report back through those uh, two arrangements. And I think uh, the best way forward would be for the funding to come in and for it to be operating within one ledger for the IGIB, which will then allow the IGIB to make um, better decisions um, around how it loses its identity and where it's at just now. But the system that we're currently operating in encourages uh, the funding to still uh, work through the local authority ledger and work through the health board ledger. Therefore, you don't lose its identity the way that the legislation um, was intended. And I think the way to change that would be to look for one direct funding allocation to IGIBs and to remove the two elements that come from the two partners. So you, you support direct funding from central government? We, we um, support, and it's in our submission, that we would like to explore further direct allocations of funding to IGIBs. You won't be surprised to know that that is not a proposition that Causal and Scottish local government would support. We think an essential ingredient in the success of health and care is the ongoing partnership uh, between the NHS and local government um, and the connection between the, the health and care bodies, IGBs, and local government services is vital. Um, because the integration um, doesn't just happen within the boundaries of the IGB. I mean, for example, um, in West Lothian, my, my home council, um, the chief officer of the IGB is also a deputy chief officer, deputy chief executive of the council. And the IGB is wholly integrated. And so all the arguments we've been making about frontline council services being essential to tackling inequality and meeting our preventative issues are all joined up and working together to achieve these aims. And that's not just a West Lothian thing, that's happening across across Scotland. Um, in terms of the budget, I think there are issues about the timescales. Local government and the NHS prepared their budgets at different timescales. It would be helpful if these could be brought more in line. Um, and for us, one of the key elements um, that is causing concern is the NHS attitude towards um, set-aside budgets. Um, that's maybe a technical term, set aside budgets by that. What I mean is unscheduled care budgets. The, the law, the Public Bodies Act, states that, that these monies must be transferred to the IGB. There are some issues about that. And for us, it's fairly fundamental, firstly, that the NHS actually follows the law and transfers the set aside budgets. But also, that if you just think about this, what we're about is creating an integrated care pathway from the community into an acute hospital setting and back to the community again. That's what the IGB was created to do. And if the NHS um, at times are unwilling to transfer these budgets into the, the domain of the IGB, that is hindering integration. And it's something which already has been agreed by the Parliament. And we just hope that um, colleagues here can make sure that that does actually happen across the country. So, so, but technically, there's actually nothing to stop an IGB making those changes. It seems to be that the legislation is very clear. It's just you appear to be not inventing reasons for not doing something, but it, it really isn't an issue around how you're funded from the two constituent partners. It, it's more likely to be the fact that you're relatively new. Um, you know, you've got these funding pressures that you've already talked about. So actually to make transfer, transformational change when you're trying to manage a funding pressure and you're looking for other cuts to transfer that elsewhere is actually probably a bigger challenge. But it would be correct to say there's nothing whatsoever stopping you actually making transformational change and changing the way you spend money just because you're funded by two constituent parts. I suppose I, I would just echo what I said um, at, at the beginning. My, my, my anxiety is that if we substantially change the, 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 way, we, the way we fund services, or we, there's a substantial uh, shift in resource from a council budget to an NHS budget or vice versa, it might be problematic in terms of the future. Um, as I say, I think the council would, would very much resist um, subsidising what it sees as a, as, as a lack of, of, of core NHS budget and potentially vice versa when money goes to, to, to the social care. However, 
Um, we haven't tested that properly, so you, you may be right. It might not be an issue at all. Um, I suspect, given my experience, it, it, it would be. Can, can I just ask one sort of technical little question in the presentation of the budget? One of the criticisms last year um, was around an accusation of double counting by the government when it came to the budget. Um, Parliament's uh, in, Independent Information Service Spice said that the £107 million that was allocated for social care um, was effectively already included in the health budget totals, uh, but also alluded to in the section around local governments. Effectively, ministers were, were using the, the same £107 million to cite growth in both budgets. Um, and I think the Fraser Allendale Institute actually said this was highly controversial and, and frankly not right. Do you think that was a fair criticism? And just from a presentational point of view in terms of the budget, where should those allocations actually sit? Probably the, um, from uh, the finance officer's perspective, the funding was allocated to health. It transferred across to the IGIBs and was spent on the social care side of our budget. Um, Again, no, we come back to how budgets are allocated and our view um, is that that funding could have been directly allocated actually to the IGIBs. Um, now, that's a, a, a different um, response. However, I think it probably would have been a, um, more, a better reflection on what was intended with that funding and how that funding uh, was to be allocated. Um, and what it does is it creates us additional challenges and actually bringing that money um, across by having to, to bill um, for that funding coming across. And I think that comes back to the point I was making. We are working within uh, two systems and two ledgers, and we put that money back through two ledgers within the council and within the health board ledgers. So the funding doesn't necessarily lose its identity. But what does happen is you will see that funding as expenditure on the health side, but you will also see uh, that funding as expenditure through the local authority side having been directed back by the IGIB. So from a public finance point of view, is that the way, is that not the way it should be done? I think from our perspective, our view is um, we need to look at how we allocate funds direct um, rather than having quite a convoluted way of funding being allocated to the IGIBs and all the additional work that goes behind it. We are looking to try and improve and be more efficient in how funding is allocated going forward. But I'm not quite getting to the nub of this as to whether that funding was in two places. Do you agree that that was? My view is yes, it was in two places because there was expenditure on the health side and there was health, uh, there was expenditure on the local authorities side as a result um, of that transfer taking place. And it was the same money? Yes, it was a transfer from one to the other. Thank you. Uh, Brian. Thank you, Kabir, and uh, good morning, panel. I see I really welcome um, Mr Johnson's submission, the COSLA submission, and, and, and if I can a quote at paragraph 15 when it says that given the committee's remit which covers sport as well as health we would also emphasise the benefits sport brings to the preventative agenda sport brings undoubted health well-being benefits and encourage healthy active lives supporting mental as well as physical health and promoting communities so with that in mind do the panel think that the, the, the current budget allows for effective preventative health planning uh, and furthermore um, how challenging is it to balance um, uh, planning that spend against potential future ch future uh, savings that, that, that is inevitable within a preventable health budget? Shall I start with that? Um, I think, Mr. Bethel, you make and reinforce the point that is the core to the Causeway argument, that we can't simply look at the health and care budget in isolation. Uh, there are many things which contribute to health and well-being which are not directly within the IGBs or the NHS. Um, the example of sport is, is well made uh, and I, mean, I can reinforce that again with a local example. Uh, for almost a decade now in, in West Lothian, um, if someone goes to their GP suffering with depression, they've been able to be, instead of prescribed drugs, um, prescribed a six-week course in a local fitness centre. Um, run by West Lothian Leisure, um, admittedly an arm's length body of the council. But that's a recognition that um, physical activity may well be, for some people, a better um, outcome uh, and a better cure for the illness they're suffering 
than just simply being prescribed drugs. And I don't think there's any argument that um, healthy and our healthy and well a well population requires access to, to these vital facilities. Um, and if core budgets are being cut across local government, the stress of maintaining these facilities is clearly one which is going to be detrimental to uh, the outcome that we're all looking to work together to achieve. Uh, and so that's clearly where we're coming from. i just ask a supplementary, please. So in that case, in that particular example there, which, which, is, which is a particularly pertinent one, um, there'd be a saving to the health service because of the non-prescribing of, of, of drugs, but a cost to the council in, in uh, allowing leisure facilities uh, available to the, to the, the patient. Is that, true? Is that true? That's very true. Um, unfortunately, um, there's no means of accounting for that in the system. Uh, we don't get back the cost of what the drugs would have been into our, providing our health and care facilities, or health and fitness facilities in this case. Um, but it is contributing um, to the overall outcome, which is what is important. Thank you. Um, Alex. Thank you, convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, I'm also very interested by the COSLA paper. It's pretty heavy stuff in terms of where the government is going and its uh, approach to budgeting and um, feeding into the IJB process. I'd like to particularly quote one line in paragraph five, which is there is a, a disconnect between public narrative around level of investment in public services versus budget pressures. And above that, there's a continued focus on inputs and not outcomes. Over the summer, we saw one outcome of spending decisions in the fact that drug deaths in this country let by as much as a third, making us the worst performing uh, country in the European Union in terms of substance-related mortality. Um, can the committee, so that, that's a weather vane of an outcome uh, which is going wrong, and it should be a weather vane for the budgeting process as to where we're deciding to, to prioritise spending. Can the committee say, where, is the, where are we broken in that system? Is that, a pro is that the fault of central government? Is that the fact that when central government said, well, we've passed the money to the um, boards, even though there's a cut, they can still deliver outcomes by reprioritizing? Is it the fault of the boards? Um, who, where does the disconnect lie? Right. <laughs> well, in terms, in terms of the ADP allocations, is that what you're specifically well, yeah, uh, if yeah. you can focus on that, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, um, well, I, in terms of the ADP allocations, clearly the, 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 the funding was passed to health boards with a reduction, and uh, health boards were asked to reprioritise. Now, uh, there are so many different priorities, it's quite difficult to see where, where funding would come from for that. Uh, at the end of the day, our health board did um, give us the, the allocation straight through. Um, but that was due to probably the compliance test that was put in place around around budget and settlement. Uh, so we did make a, a, a bit of a local saving. Our, our drug deaths are are low locally. We, um, our demographic is such that our, our drug deaths are relatively low, but they have risen across Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Um, and I suppose different different ADPs and health and social care partnerships are, are targeting their resources in different ways. We, re we target ours in recovery. I know Glasgow has, is, is targeted in, in slightly different ways. But at the end of the day, the health board did, did pass on the allocation to us. So yours is an example of good practice where you may, may do with, what, with the money mm. you were given and prioritised ADP funding to be sure that that service would continue. Yes, yeah. yes. But you are not, that's not the... No, no, I, and it's not to say we didn't make some savings, but we made some savings in a way we thought were, were low risk. Yeah. yeah. In, in, the, in Aberdeen, uh, we had the, the full effect of the, the, the cut to that budget, uh, and we've had to, to focus on how we make efficiencies with, within that. Um, I think it's difficult to, to uh, address the full extent of your question because I think it would be hard at this stage to see a straight line Correlation between a reduction in those budgets and and, and drug deaths. I, I would I would think that experts in that field would would, would consider that to be really multifactorial, um, uh, and might be attributable to a, a number of things. But certainly, how we use ADP budgets effectively to meet the priorities that we have with the increasing demand for those services um, is a, a significant focus for ADPs. And, and given that those budgets were allocated to the the IGBs, obviously a significant focus for for them as well. I, I understand that it is multifactorial 
as you suggest. However, I had meetings over the summer with the senior consultant who was compiling the drug death um, statistic who pointed to our direct causal relationship between a 23% cut in ADP funding um, and, and this increase in drug deaths. I mean, I understand that there are many different reasons why people die of overdoses, but if we are withdrawing services that can manage their lifestyles or get them clear of their um, their behaviours, then then we can actually address those statistics. Absolutely, would agree. And the, the the challenge then in relation to the entirety of that budget um, is in in supporting meeting those priorities, while also finding the reduction in savings uh, to to balance that or address that gap from from elsewhere in the totality of the budget, which is also under under pressure and increasing demand. Comment on the the generality of that question. What I take from that is what. You're asking what impact has the integration of health and social care budgets had on meeting government outcomes and, and local government outcomes. And for me, I think it's clear that across Scotland, IGBs are making good progress. And we're beginning to see tangible changes in service design and the essential strategic commissioning that goes along with that. However, the key question remains that to have and deliver the pace and scale of change we need, um, and to do more to support the integration, to focus on reducing demand and on prevention and early intervention. Um, that, that is the challenge we're facing, to get the resource to do that. And I think this needs an acceptance that moving services, for example, from an acute setting uh, to within the community and delivering them differently is not a cut. It's, a, it's simply an improvement. And, and we have to recognise that reducing hospital beds and investing in our communities it's not a bad thing. It's actually the way we can move ahead and achieve the transformation that we're all looking to deliver. Uh, so, so you, sorry, um, you're saying that it's not... I mean, this, this whole process, there isn't an, an element of cuts within it. I mean, uh, the, your paper would disagree with you on that. That's not what I said. What I'm saying is that you know, the, the difficulty we have, looking at the, whole bud the budget as a whole is meeting the day-to-day -day service requirements and at the same time fund the transformational change that we're all looking to deliver. And what I was trying to put into this um, discussion was that we need to accept that moving services from an acute setting into the community is not necessarily a cut, um, but it is a change in how we deliver things and it may be a better way of delivering the outcomes that we're looking to achieve and that we need to accept that reduced numbers of hospital beds can deliver better outcomes. Uh, and that is a good thing. Oh, I don't disagree, I, absolutely. But your own paper states that reductions to core local government budgets and no cognizance of the interrelationship between all that local authorities do to reduce inequalities, build community capacity, resilience and assets, and decrease demand for service in other parts of the system, such as health and social care. So, I mean, there is a material reduction in the money coming forward. Paper, I'm simply giving you an, a specific yeah. example, which a I think absolutely. is important. And, and, I, and we all know stakeholders and people who work in the sector, organisations that do miracles with next to nothing and are having forced to increasingly do miracles <coughs> with next to nothing. Um, and I accept what you say about uh, service redesign, and it absolutely has its place. But we have to, I think it's important for this committee to recognise the landscape in which we're operating. Thank you, convener. Jenny. Morning to the panel. Uh, just to follow up on my colleague Brian Whittle's comment with regard to, to budgets, um, Peter Johnson, you said at the start of your submission, you said you can't look at the health budget in isolation, and you also spoke uh, there just about prevention and early intervention. Um, and in the cost of submission, you say that if we are to achieve a flourishing Scotland, then we need to deliver on our joint aim of improving Scotland's mental health and wellbeing. And on that point as well, um, in the East End submission, um, Julie Murray, you essentially argue for targeting services for preventative services, uh, including specific waiting times, and, and CAMS is given as an example of that. Um, CAMS is obviously the far end of the system in terms of mental health provision, so I just wonder to what extent in terms of budget um, there is scope to get out of our silos and work across other areas, so for example with education uh, in terms of mental health and, and also in terms of, I suppose, building resilience. Curriculum for Excellence within the education system actually has a whole curriculum area devoted to health and well-being. So in terms of budget pressures, is there scope then for health to work with education uh, together in terms of that? Well, the first thing I would say is, yes, there is, and it is happening. Um, and that was part of the argument from a causal perspective of not looking to directly fund IGBs and miss out the local government and NHS link, uh, remove the parent bodies. That's something that we would see as being very detrimental to that process. I think what is important um, 
from a causal perspective is that our IGBs retain the flexibility, however, to make local decision making. And COSWA worked very closely with the government in, 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 in looking to put together the, the new Mental Health Act and strategy. Um, but within that, we were very critical of the government's decision, um, which we see as an input measure, that there'd be 800 uh, new mental health workers and telling us as in local government and within IGBs to exactly where they, was, they would have to be located. We don't find that helpful. We would welcome the 800 and the funding for the 800, but we would like the ability to make a local decision as to where they would be best located to suit the needs of our communities. Yeah, and I, I would just like to say that we work very closely with education in East Renfrewshire. We've got a, 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 a solid foundation in terms of our, our children's services planning and the work we do in early years. And I think, and I, I think what my, our um, submission referred to was actually we've got huge waiting lists for CAMs because actually we are not providing this, the, 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 the tier two, the, the, the different sorts of support. Uh, so actually we wouldn't invest in CAMs, we'd invest in something different. And we've got some examples of that. We, 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 we part fund um, schools counselling and we've just, um, we're looking at some reinvestment on a one-off basis to see if it works of some of the savings because we have shifted the balance of care from children's residential uh, we're, 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 we're not uh, sending as many children away to school and, and to secure accommodation. So we're investing in a service that's, it's, that's a, built around GPs, uh, uh, GP clusters around some family support that so prevents inappropriate actual, actually referrals to, to CAMS. Some of the kids that are being referred to CAMS don't actually need that level of support. They need something different. So we are trying to be very creative and working with our third sector organisations. It's Children First that are running that, that service for us. Thank you. Um, and on, on your point, you, did you say you had long waiting times for CAMS? Is that what you said? Our waiting times for CAMS, we're just we're on target, but it's still it's still um, you know it's a long it's can a long you, wait. Can you quantify that? It's an eighteen week. Um, it's an eighteen week wait. Um, oh. And uh, our our CAMS service is under pressure. But when we've done an so analysis, how many? How many are you, what's the percentage of people who are meeting the 18 week? Oh, I, I don't have that off the top of my head. Could I'm you, afraid could you I, provide I can provide us with that? that certainly, certainly. But when so we've looked you? at our waiting list, we thought a lot of the a lot of the kids that are on the waiting list actually probably need something different to CAMS. Sorry, Jim. Just as a specific follow up to that, then in terms of that intervention, you know, you, you talked about a kind of tier two before they get to the CAMS, you know, waiting list, as it were. Um, I'm a Fife MSP, and I know that Fife's one of the five, I think, health boards across Scotland who haven't met that 18 week target. Um, so do you think there's, there's scope then in terms of the budget to get into schools with the healthcare, you know, provision or perhaps with councillors? You've, you've given examples of that. Do you think that could alleviate budget pressures if that was to happen and perhaps reduce waiting times as a result? I think it would, yes. Yeah. I think it would. And, uh, but the challenge for us is, you know, we know that some of these preventive things work well. And the challenge is protecting that, that budget. When our budgets get reduced and reduced and reduced, and you have to look at the, those at most risk. So it is a real, it is a real challenge to protect that, that preventive element. And for us, one of the ways of doing that is to partner with other organisations um, wh who can apply for funding, for example. Um, yeah, OK. Uh, just one really quick question. Just as a follow-up, uh, Sharon, um, you mentioned in terms of having two different reporting bodies. You've got local authorities and health boards when you're reporting back. Um, with regard to your budget, do you think that feeds into a lack of budget transparency because you're reporting back to two different bodies and therefore it's much more difficult to evidence that government outcomes in terms of health have been met? Do you think that creates a lack of transparency? Um, each of the IGIBs do have uh, their own budget monitoring arrangements that they take to their IGIB uh, on a regular basis. So there is a joint uh, budget report which goes in and goes in on a regular basis to give IGIB members where the budget position at, is at in each of the uh, IGIBs across the country. So they do see that collective um, budget uh, monitoring report. However, we still also have to operationally uh, feed into the health board and the council side, whereas you start to see that split uh, of that budget happening. And my view is I think the, the joined up one budget would be a better way to help that budget lose its identity going forward. OK, thank you. To the panel, um, one of the themes to emerge from the uh, written submissions is the a cluttered landscape of performance frameworks. It's already been touched on issues of budgets, losing of identity, and Councillor Johnson touched on um, the need for meeting outcomes. I just would like to hear the panel's views and if they feel there is um, sufficient clarity in the government's stated priorities for health. Um, I think that's 
So that question is yes, there is clarity in the stated outcomes. <coughs> um, and I would ask you to recognise that how these outcomes are delivered, again, a point I want to reinforce, IGBs need the flexibility to deliver on local outcomes. Um, and that's part of the reason that I think you might be raising this question about clarity, um, because you have a national outcome, but the ways of achieving that outcome will be different in each locality. And that's part of the reason why, for example, the Public Bodies Working Act required IGBs, not to, even within their own area, just have to have uh, one locality. It recognised that different localities needed different solutions, but they're all working towards the same outcome. And I think the clarity in terms of that, these national outcomes is absolutely there. But how we get there, we just need the flexibility to do it differently. I would agree with uh, Councillor Johnson's uh, assessment there. I think there is, is clarity. Um, I think we obviously work with uh, quite a, a broad range uh, of outcome measures, uh, and, and that sometimes can be um, challenging. I would absolutely echo the, the, the requirement and indeed the, the, the real benefit that we can gain from that local flexibility and, and really working with communities on, on good outcomes for them. Um, because we work within different geographies, even in a city, a small city like Aberdeen, um, different health outcomes, different health inequalities across the city, and we need to be able to focus on improvements at a very, very local population level. Uh, so I think there is clarity. We work uh, and have developed our own performance framework which, uh, th through which we seek to both demonstrate delivery against our, our na nine national health and wellbeing out outcomes, but also underneath that, a range of indicators that reflect real local need, local improvement, uh, so that we're able to see the impact that we're making in Aberdeen and in communities in Aberdeen. Yes, I, I, I would agree with, 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 my, with my colleagues. I think probably the vision is clear. Um, uh, and um, we've, got, we've got clarity in terms of health and social care delivery plan. We, we all provide, or we've all just produced um, our own performance reports. Um, and we, because we have children's services and criminal justice included in the partnership, we brought together the nine outcomes with um, with outcomes for children's services and, and, and community justice too, and we reported against these. Um, but I, I, I do think that the, the focus should be an outcome and, and 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 not prescription around the best way to achieve that outcome. No, um, well, that's uh, that's very helpful. Now, another area that's come up is, um, again, this seems to be perennial um, dispute over direct funding or continuation of the current mode of funding. Is there a middle ground? Um, if direct funding is not an option, what could be done to uh, improve collaboration between health boards and local authorities within IJBs? Um, well, I think the first thing that would be helpful would be to try and bring together the timetables within which NHS budgets and council budgets are determined and agreed. That, that would be a significant step forward. Um, I think it would also be helpful if monies that were directed into social care did not have to go through the health board route, but came directly to local government. Um, I think that would increase transparency and perhaps deal with some of the issues that colleagues were raising earlier. Um, but I think we are, um, I think, we've got a tremendous vision for health and care and an integrated delivery of health and social care. I think we're making good progress with this, um, but I think the, the key message I, I would hope we're, I'm trying to convey is that to deliver the transformational change we need in the time scale in the time scales that we need it, um, we need to resource IGBs properly to do that, and we have major concerns currently. They probably have sufficient budget to stand still, but they're having sufficient, or not sufficient, but having tremendous challenges in trying to deliver the change that is needed at the same time as delivering the services that we need to deliver. Uh, and that's the key message, I think, which I, I hope we're trying to get over to you. Um, Julie, you raised your eyebrows when uh, Peter said the sufficient budget to stand still. Uh, I, I, you disagree? Well, I, dis I, I, I do, actually. <laughs> I think to stand still next year, we would need probably an additional additional £3 million, and our, our scenario planning suggests we'll probably get £3 million less. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I, you know, I don't think we do have enough money to stand still. In doing things the, the, the way we've always done them, I think for us, I think because we've been on an integration journey for 10 years, 
we have um, probably cr have had quite a lot of innovation and, and creativity in, in what we've in what we've delivered, and we're beginning to beginning to get to the end of that line. I have to say. Um, I think and, and, uh, th 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 there's a real challenge for, for chief officers because as chief officers of an advisors to integration joint boards, what you might suggest would be good for the integration joint board in terms of protected money and or perhaps direct allocation isn't necessarily, um, isn't necessarily what your parent bodies would like and you are line managed by ch uh, chief executives from the council and the NHS board who may have very different views. On, on issues such as set aside or, or direct funding, so there are there are there are real challenges for us. Uh, I mean, for personally, there are some real attractions to direct funding, um, but but some of the, the some of the issues would be taken care of by better timing, as Peter says, um, and uh, and so there would be some some disadvantages because, as I say, we, we we very much need to to be part of the local community planning family. Um, so I've I've got sort of mixed feelings, but I think if if there was a sense that IGB budgets were protected as much as they possibly can be to meet the strategic priorities um, with, within a sort of context of parent bodies continuing to fund, then, then that would be fine. In Aberdeen, we, we developed a, a, a local protocol to try and support us over the, 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 uh, the process of budget setting for, for three organisations. NHS Grampian has, has tried very hard um, to align its budget setting process with that of the council and we've made some some real strides in that and that was really in anticipation of when it's going to get difficult because relationships across all our organisations in the North East and in Aberdeen have been really really good uh, but as budget pressures hit both organisations and the IGB seeks to make different decisions uh, obviously they, they can become strained and, and, and put under pressure so, so the budget protocol sets out the expectations a, a degree in, in terms of timeline how we'll work uh, and the opportunity um, against a, a difficult sort of um, fiscal background for the IGB to be making um, a representation to the partner organisations in terms of an increase in budget if we can demonstrate need, demographic pressure, pressure and so on. That's not to say that we'll get it, but, but it allows us that reflecting what's, what's in the legislation. So, so that's been a really, really helpful process. Like my colleague Julie, I, I've got mixed feelings in terms of the, the, the direct allocation. On, on the one hand, that seems very straightforward and simple uh, because it's very time consuming managing budgets ac across three organisations and, and hugely complex. However, I do absolutely recognise the benefit of being part of that, that, that family of public sector organisations in an area and the ability that that gives us to be having discussions, particularly with the local authority, around how some of their other mainstream budgets, housing budgets are a good example of that, education, children's services, you, you've talked about how they can be brought to bear uh, to support the overall ambition around reducing health inequalities, um, focusing and targeting our effort on, on communities of particular disadvantage and, and, and inequality and so on. So um, I, I think that, that needs to be seen as the, the overall context in terms of how we get an allocation, but that's not to detract from the complexity of actually managing as a chief officer in that with the, 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 the various calls on, on, on your time and your, uh, your, your focus, as well as the, the, the regular reporting, as, as my colleague CFO has, has mentioned, it, it is challenging. Our, our standstill cost is about 8.7 million with what we've observed. Uh, it costs us that to, to stand still is our forecast. Do you have enough? Do you think you have enough? Uh, we're, we're forecasting some significant pressures in the budget. Uh, we do have uh, reserves that we've put aside for this, but of course our ability to use reserves uh, impacts our ability to transform. And, and I think that's the real conundrum in this. We're very ambitious in Aberdeen to change our services, but we're also very realistic in terms of how long it's going to take us to change and the pace that we can move at. Um, so um, but the, the, the pressures that we face uh, will definitely impact on our ability to, to move at the pace that we want to, and we'll have to uh, continually look at how we adjust our expectations and plans on, on transformation against uh, our duty, our requirement under the legislation to break even. Sounded a bit like a no there, but we'll leave it at that. Tom, you one final. Can I maybe just add Sorry, that yeah, the yeah, um, 
If you look at the budget settlement last year, there's quite a lot of direction from the Scottish Government about the budget allocation to the IGIBs, and it actually um, was quite directive about the, the maximum level of savings, etc., that could be taken uh, from the IGIBs budget. And that actually did help um, a lot of the IGIBs be protected from potentially a wider savings target that they could have been faced um, in the current financial year. <clears throat> I would just like to add to that that um, that was one element of it, and there was it, also on the health side there was the flat cash guidance that went out with it as well, which again it was given to try and help and protect it, the IGIBs going forward. However, it hasn't taken away from quite a lot of long discussions around what budget allocation should be, and IGIBs are still um, in the position this year of still about to finalise their budget for 17-18. So, from a timing perspective. Ideally, IGIBs would want to set their budgets before the end of March. But some of the discussions that we're having around what the budget level um, should be for the IGIBs has taken those timescales well beyond that period, which is ideal when you're also trying to deliver uh, quite substantial savings targets as well. Uh, final supplementary to Julie Murray and Judith Rockter. You've outlined what you would need to essentially tread water. In an idealised, ideal situation, how much do you believe you would require to, to realise the vision of shifting the balance of care? Mm. I think, per, sorry, personally, I, 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 don't have a, I don't have a figure at the top of my head, but um, I think what we require to really shift the balance of care is probably some trans transitional bridging funding. I think there are resources within the system um, I think we, we, as a whole, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, where, where East Renfrewshire is, is quite a complex system. There are six partnerships. I think if we work together with the Health Board and Acute Services, as, as we are doing, we could uh, release some significant resource uh, to, to locally to develop community services. But we probably need some funding up front to develop the services before hospital beds close. I don't have a figure at the top of my... I think in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a system like Greater Glasgow and Clyde, I'm thinking probably five, five years. Um, we've only got about ten minutes left, and I've got four members who still uh, want to come in, so can people be as short as possible, Snappy? Um, Miles? Thank you, Convener. Um, I wanted to look at point 23 from the COSLA paper, which outlined um, that there are a number of accountability and audit issues which have become evident as the work of the IJBs have progressed. And I wonder if, if the panel could outline in some more detail what they have been and what steps you've taken yourselves to address that. And a further point was, with the discussion we've had around budgeting um, and the experience in Northern Ireland, would you support shifting towards a single budgeting situation? the question. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, so <laughs> being short and snappy. 23 really quickly. Yes, it's okay. It was just the last point in that paragraph which um, states that accountability and auditing issues have become evident um, as the work of the IJBs have progressed. And I wondered if you could outline what you have seen um, in your own areas, those being, and anything you've done to, to try to rectify them, especially around benchmarking of services. I think around benchmarking of services, that can be quite difficult because of the, the, the range of different services that, that some IGBs have. So Julie referred to having children's services, children's social work services within her partnership. It doesn't sit within ours, so um, that, that can create uh, d different dynamics. Uh, I think sometimes the length of partnerships being up and running um, and, and the ways of working there also so can reflect. But I think my colleague uh, Sharon's addressed some of the issues of, of accountability and audit um, and in terms of the complexity of the landscape. Uh, particularly around audit, where we're, we're seeking to be streamlined uh, around audit processes, provide assurance and, and, and um, uh, accountability to partner organisations to do that also within the IGB, but not duplicate some of that, that, that audit. So, so working through that, um, that remains a, 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 a work in progress uh, for us, but we're being very, very uh, clear in, in trying to do that, but it can be quite complicated to, to work through. Um, I'm not sure if that was what you were asking. 
I think one of the areas that Scotland has highlighted is that there's further work required around the set aside, which is the unscheduled care aspect of the acute budget. And I think we all recognise that there hasn't been uh, the advance that we would like to see in that area of work. And it's def definitely an area where we are doing a lot of work uh, this financial year to try and look at better arrangements around uh, the set aside budget. Um, this is a key area for us in relation to shifting the balance of care. And as Julie said, it's an area where it would be helpful to have some um, spend to save monies where we could uh, look at bridging finance to move from the acute system and move services across into community settings. And it's a it's a complex area, but it's an area that we do need to make uh, progress uh, to sh show and demonstrate uh, that shift in the balance of care going forward. Um, and the, my final point was on um, budgeting and in terms of Northern Ireland, how they've actually, um, with integration, moved things forward towards single budgeting. Do you think that's a good idea, um, given some of the concerns you've raised this morning? The, the um, system in Northern Ireland in a number of years, but when I, I did look at it, I, I understand the, 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 the structure created a, a number of single boards. Um, however, in some measures, the last time I looked, they weren't actually making some of the progress that we had in Scotland over uh, particular elements of, of, of resettling people with, with mental health and learning disability. Uh, so I think there's still some challenges in terms of delivering outcomes despite the, the, the single structure. As I say, I, I don't know if that remains the case it's probably a, a good three or four years since I last looked, um, but it, it could certainly be interesting to look at comparisons there of where it has has worked, where they have made progress against maybe where where we are managing to to achieve better outcomes for our population. Yeah, I can only reinforce the point I made already that Cosa would not support single budgeting if it means removing budgets from local government and the democratic control of local councils and putting and taking the money away and then centrally giving it to a, a new uh, nationally funded uh, range of IGBs. We th think that would be damaging to the process. It would probably require legislation, I think, from top of my head, in terms of the, what's in the public bodies working at. And it's exactly the, what we should not be contemplating when we're facing the challenges we are in shifting the balance of cheer, care and delivering for our communities. It would be a total distraction. OK, Ross. I'd just like to go back to the point around the link between expenditure and outcomes. I know in the past the committee has uh, found that the boards have found it extremely difficult to provide analysis of this. The Cabinet Secretary has acknowledged it. It's in a number of the uh, submissions here, including the, the East Renfrewshire submission. I was just wondering what progress has actually been made on that, on making that link, on being able to provide that, that data, that information. Okay, uh, well, it is something we're struggling with. Um, and I think everyone is struggling with it. And I think uh, we are hoping that um, some colleagues from Scottish Government who might be behind me and uh, the, the, the chief finance officers can, can, can start working together to provide a national framework because the difficulty is we might all try and, and, and do things in a, in a different way and then there, it would be difficult to, to compare. But, it, but it, it, is, it, is com it is complicated because there are many uh, services we provide and bits of our budget that contribute to a number of the outcomes. So. Um, I think we do need some, some sort of national guidance for that uh, and, and try not to make it a, a really time-consuming piece of work because uh, I, we don't know, you know potentially what value that it might have. I think, um, taking on Julie's point, if you take, for example, the home care budget, the home care budget actually um, meets a number of the objectives, so it's very difficult to split that budget on how much of that budget helps delay discharges as opposed to how much of that budget actually helps maintain people uh, in their own home. So I think the challenge is, yes, these budgets are there, we know which objectives that they actually support, but it's very difficult to actually split that money eh, across those um, outcomes that we're actually achieving. I think a different way may well be is to show here are the budgets and here are the outcomes that they do support. Um, and I think that would be a step in moving that direction. But we do have a lot of budgets that support a number eh, of the outcomes, which is why we've got a challenge with it. The, uh, providing that's obviously re required by the legislation, it doesn't sound particularly ideal or, or easy to uh, deliver requirement. Taking Julie's uh, point around the, the need for frameworks, and I assume also that capacity is a, a big issue here, what else is required to help move towards being able to actually deliver that? 
capacities and framework? Ca well, capacity <laughs> is an issue locally, and I think if we were able to work together, the chief officers have a, have a strong network, as do the chief finance officers, as do our planners. So perhaps with, 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 with some Scottish government colleagues, because I, I'd wondered whether we had guidance, but we, we don't actually have, have, have that, so we can try and develop something, I think. Thank you. Um, Ivan. Thanks, Convener. Thanks, panel. Um, I just wanted to touch on the preventative agenda, uh, spend agenda, um, and just referring back to Christy, who floated some big numbers, up to 40% potential savings in public services if resources were focused on prevention rather than rather than symptoms. Um, and obviously, the whole IGB agenda is supposed to move us towards that through through closer integrated working, and in particular shift from acute spending into, into community spending, etc. Um, so I suppose I wanted to explore, if you, if you think about the process of that, what should happen, obviously, is you put resources into prevention and then at some point down the line we save money because we're not having to spend money on, um, on cure. Um, and I suppose I just wanted to touch on some specific examples of have we seen anything like that actually manifesting itself in savings. Um, it's the first part of the question. And I'm thinking there specifically about Peter Johnson mentioned what happened in West Lothian where doctors were prescribing um, fitness classes. Um, and in theory, what should happen if you've been doing that for 10 years by now, we should see some output from that. We should see a reduction in your, um, your, your, your drugs bill compared to other comparable areas. You should see an improvement in health outcomes. And I just want to know, is there any evidence that supports that? Um, in Eastern Bartonshire, you've clearly been, been said you were integrated for, for 10 years. And, are there examples there of things you've managed to do in the last five or ten years that where you're seeing outcomes that are actually having a beneficial effect on the budget? And then I suppose taking that to a macro level, it's um, if you had um, a blank bit of paper, um, what would you be spending money on um, now and where would you expect to see savings from that, real savings, five or ten years down the line? Because I always get the impression that everybody talks to talk about prevention, the concept's great, everybody talks to talk about we need more money to get us over the funding, do the double funding just now. But when you actually push on, well, where does that mean you would save money in five or ten years? It's a bit more vague. That was a short version. <laughs> <laughs> Could the answers be somewhat yeah, more succinct? It is not easy to give a short answer to that. In terms of do you see immediate benefits in the budget, the answer is probably no, you don't, because we have demographic challenges, the population is changing, the needs of the population is changing, demand is increasing. So at the same time as you make reductions uh, by doing one thing, demand for, for different services comes in uh, and overflows that. Um, so it's, it's, it's standing still is not really an option. Um, but I think in, in terms of priorities, um, I think probably there's a consensus that we want to move to a more equal society. Um, and surely all policy proposals should be challenged to the extent that they actually address and target inequalities. Um, that's certainly the cause of you. Um, we'd want to see more investment in testing and financing new models of social care simply because we recognise that we cannot go on standing still. Um, I remember seeing, um, it was a picture of, um, I spent some time on the Healthcare Improvement Scotland Board, and they, they came up with this example from the 1870s, which had, that was the time the steamships came in, and sailing ships adapted to this challenge from the steamships by putting more masts, more sails on their boats, until eventually they turned over and sank. Um, now, that analogy, is, I think, has stuck with me because it's very powerful. If we continue to do the same things as we are doing, our health and care system simply will not cope. We have to find the mechanism for doing things differently, um, meeting the outcomes we want, and that requires investment and resources to fund the transformational change that we, I think we all agree is absolutely necessary. Anybody else want to comment on that? Can I maybe just give um, an example? Um, in, in, in Glasgow City, IGIB, um, there's been a lot of investment into services around intermediate care, around reablement. Uh, we also have a direct ordering of home care that nurses from hospitals can directly order to allow patients to be discharged within four hours. And the result of that is we have actually seen a significant decrease in our unscheduled bed days lost as a result of that work. And that's very much us trying to move from... Um, acute 
back to bringing people into community and then trying to get people back home. And then we are, will be looking at how we then focus more on the preventative end. But our first challenge was to try and get people home quickly and safely back into their community. And it has actually um, produced dividends. And the bed days loss in Glasgow has went from 38,152 to 15,557. Has that been in financial terms? We have um, done a lot of work in what the investment we have put in, and we know from uh, the figures in relation to bed days lost um, what that unit cost would come back to. In relation to an overall figure, I don't have it to hand today, but I can get you that. That would be great, thanks. And just going back to, to Peter Johnson's point, I um, understand, but I was very careful in my question to say compared to other areas that weren't doing the same intervention. So back to the question, is there any evidence of a cost saving the, the fact that West Lothian has been prescribing fitness classes rather than medication um, in financial terms or health outcome terms compared to other areas that weren't making that intervention. Because if there isn't, we might think it's the right thing to do, but we've absolutely no evidence to say that it is the right thing to do. And if there isn't any evidence on that, then it really questions the whole preventative agenda because if it doesn't save money, you've really got to go, ba go back and question whether what was in Christie was correct or not. I can't tell you that top of the head. I think, in, in principle, I tried to answer that. But what I'm happy to do is I can go back uh, and ask my colleagues on West Lothian Council for some figures that may or may not answer your question. Um, Brian. Well, back to me then. Thank you, Kavina. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm just I was kind of a, a, a following on from some of the discussion I was uh, earlier on. I think it's Manchester that, in terms of budgeting, uh, the education budget and the health budget kind of cross over, and there is some there, are, there is the ability to, to to move some of those funds about according to to need. So education, is, as um, my colleague General Guruth said, uh, intervention um, being important, we think in the in the, the health agenda and obvious challenges involved in that. But is that is that is that something that's worth? Uh, a consideration is, is not, maybe not even health and, and education, but maybe bringing the welfare budget in there as well, where there's, a, where there's that crossover, there's a little bit of movement within funds. I think it's certainly a, a, an area um, that, that would be interesting, because I, I think when we talk about the preventative agenda in a partnership such as mine that has uh, um, largely services for adults, um, when we think about prevention, I think increasingly we need to think about the next generation and, and, and children and how we create the, the fittest possible generation uh, for, for the future. Um, so effort that goes into supporting children and families uh, to have healthy lifestyles, to be resilient, uh, to make good health choices, uh, I think ultimately is going to have a, a significant impact on the sustainability of, of budget. So I think it needs to be an area of focus for, for all of us, how we would achieve that with, 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 with budgets. Um, I, I don't know, but I, I think it would be a, a fruitful area of, uh, to consider, I think, closer partnerships with schools. Uh, for us, we've taken a, a real um, uh, focus in Aberdeen on our locality working and the, the opportunity and potential of working with clusters of schools, with our, our clusters of health and care services, uh, I think could, could give us a, a step into that, definitely. Okay. And Sorry, Julie, we want to no, ask I, I, I think what you're describing is community planning and, and uh, community planning partners coming to the table with resources. I think it, it's, it's particularly difficult with education at the moment in this climate because of the protection of teacher numbers. Other elements of the budgets are, are being squeezed a bit, but in terms of the work we do, we do locally, we, we come together as community planning partners and look at our resources and look at where we, we, we best target our resources. Um, Sharon mentioned that the uh, in relation to... Um, delayed discharge and, and bed days, you can put numbers on that. Um, in relation to some of the other areas of your work, where we've heard from repeatedly from people that they can't put numbers against what they're achieving, what, what, what's being done through the partnerships, how do you know what well you're, how well you're doing? I think one of the areas where they are looking at is their uh, annual performance reports, and they've just um, this year produced uh, the first of those. Um, and what that does do, um, 
within limits is uh, allow people to look at benchmarking and where they are relative to, to each other. And I think there's a lot of work going on, probably more in the, the, the heads of planning mm-hmm. uh, across all the partnerships um, around that area and looking at areas where we can all um, improve our performance and relate that to the investment that we are putting in to areas and to make sure that it actually is giving us um, the out- the outputs that we and the outcomes that we're expecting as a result of that um, and that's a, a focus that we all have around how we monitor our, our transformation programs are they achieving uh, the expectations uh, that we have set for them and then if not um, what do we do differently to change them yeah, very briefly. Uh, yeah, I was I was going to add, and I think it's in in one of the submissions, and it, it would be something I would I would absolutely uh, agree with. I think the opportunity and the role of the, the various improvement uh, organisations around the patch in Scotland could really support us in that. We're doing some work in the north of Scotland with uh, the IHUB through Healthcare Improvement Scotland to really help us understand where is the best evidence currently of what might work, uh, because I think the evidence base is 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 quite sparse uh, for many of the things that that we're trying and therefore the, the ability to demonstrate improvement and how well we're doing against that is quite difficult. Uh, so strengthening that uh, through their support of looking at cutting edge evidence, actually evaluating some of the tests of change that we are variously putting in place in Scotland could be really, really helpful. I think doing that in a very concentrated way, bringing in improvement service and others that are around there would, would be really helpful in, in, in strengthening our understanding of what works and also where savings and, and sustainability comes from from applying the evidence base uh, rigorously. OK, thanks very much. Um, uh, thanks for your evidence this morning, and I will suspend briefly to allow a change of panel.
Okay, we move on to our uh, second panel this morning. Can I welcome to the committee uh, Rachel uh, Kackett, Policy Advisor, Royal College of Nursing Scotland, uh, Elaine Tate, Chief Executive Officer, Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, Jill Vickerman, National Director, BMA Scotland, Dave Watson, Head of Policy and Public Affairs, Unison Scotland, and Dr. Miles Mack, Chair of the Royal College of General Practice Scotland. Um, we'll move directly into questions and uh, could ask Marie to open up, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel. Um, I wonder if we could together explore some of the big picture issues before drilling down into more of the detail. So um, we all are aware that hospital care can be harmful for some people. So um, being admitted, we were at the dementia centre at Stirling University at the weekend, and they were saying that almost immediately somebody with dementia who's admitted to institutional hospital care deteriorates and they don't really recover that function again. I'm aware that muscle wasting happens maybe within 72 hours of um, lying still in a hospital bed. So there is some harm coming from hospital, and yet time and time again, when I'm speaking to colleagues out in the community, I hear stories that it's much easier in a crisis to admit someone to hospital than it is to put in a package of care that would help them to stay at home. So I'm wondering if we could explore together what would better care look like? What, what would happen in these crises rather than admission to hospital? And how do we get from where we are now to there? See that we we are really pressed for time, so you know I'm looking at you here, Dave. Uh, be be brief on this one. <laughs> Miles, would you like to? Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. Um, this has been a big struggle. Um, the, as, as throughout my career, there's been moves to move services from hospitals to the community, and an expectation that that is the right thing to do. I'm delighted that the Scottish Government has followed that up with 2020 Vision, which really is on the back of other reports, like co report previously, um, which have given some cause for hope in the past, but we've really struggled to deliver that. Um, and I think when, from my college's point of view, the, the main thing that we really want to do is to ensure that we've got the workforce to do that and the investment in general practice to deliver that, um, because that's patently not been the case. Um, we've seen a fall in percentage funding to general practice, um, over the over the last few years, and unfortunately that's been continuing in the last three years that I've been opposed as well, despite our um, uh, loud clamouring to have this, this tackled, um, without the sort of um, care that my members are able to provide to, provide to look after people at home. And I think you're absolutely right with the elder population is the particular challenges to us, that our core value statement is about that long-term continuity, a comprehensive care, um, and that's um, be able to coordinate people's care through the work needs to be absolutely essential. Um, so whatever we do, we desperately need to invest in general practice, invest in GP numbers, and to make sure that we really stick close to those sort of core values that the NHS has had for a long, long time. But that's, we're not in isolation. Um, there's clear evidence that that's just important for district nursing services. Um, Helen Irvin's work, and I know you've I had evidence from her before, clearly linked um, the issue to do with um, GP and district nursing services, um, despite an overall rise in health and social care budget, as not actually being able to um, provide the sort of changes that we're looking for. So I think it's that nuanced approach that we need to. And it's, it is basic, it's basic care in, in, in people's communities, as we'd probably expect. It sounds very traditional, um, but actually it's quite revolutionary to be able to see the investment in the way we want to do to deliver that. First thing I would say is that uh, there are times when hospital is absolutely the right place for people who need hospital-based care, and we have uh, staff working through hospitals who do an amazing job in Scotland in providing that. What we need to make sure is people are only in hospital at the point when they absolutely have to be, and that is a fundamental shift there in backing up what Miles is saying and how we distribute um, our resource and our thinking about how we deliver services. One of those things is about understanding the complexity of the sort of conditions that people are now presenting with and the location in which we're then providing care support and treatment is changing. So we're looking at far more complex care therefore being delivered in the community and that requires decision makers 
to be in the right place in the community 24 7 to be able to make sure that people are getting the care and treatment they need in their home or in their care home or wherever it is that they happen to be that's out of the hospital setting that those people have the right access to fellow clinicians within the acute sector to make decisions in the moment to try and keep people at home where that's the appropriate thing to do and to get them out and of course that requires a real rethink of how our workforce is configured so one of those things is the the nhs is a people fueled economy um, it doesn't work without the people and actually that really does require us to be investing in the right places so um, for example this afternoon miles myself and colleagues from across pharmacy and optometry are meeting with scottish government as part of a primary care vision collective to talk to them about how jointly we can really rethink how we develop primary care across all the professions to make that work and, and bring forward that vision that you're talking about, that the government's talking about through the 2020 vision. And yet we do this at a backdrop where, you know, we do have significant vacancies um, within district nursing alone. We're looking at a 5.5% vacancy rate within health visiting. It's over 7%. You know, we do have gaps. Um, one of the things that we need to be careful of in terms of numbers is not just talking about how many more, but actually going back to my point about complexity, what are we asking those people to be doing? And what's the volume of work that's coming their way? Um, there were discussions this morning around set-aside funds. I think that's absolutely key when it comes to thinking about how we transfer um, resource, if that is indeed what we are going to do as complexity gets greater. And there is an issue about what our hospitals become as uh, the complexity of need increases and how expensive that hospital care will be to, to provide. But there is an issue for us in thinking through those set-aside funds in what we're talking about, if you like, is free cash to move and what we're actually talking about in terms of people to move. And we need to make sure from our perspective as the Royal College of Nursing that we obviously have the right nursing workforce with far fewer vacancies, with people at the right skill level to make those clinical decisions so that people's care can be delivered in the community where that is the most appropriate thing to do. Joe. Sorry. Yeah. Do you want to... Thank you very much. Uh, conscious of your comment about the, the lack of time, Neil, so I, I'm not going to reiterate many of the points that, that Miles and, and Rachel have made, and, and the, the members of the BMA co consistently tell me the very same thing, so I think there's a, there's a huge amount of, sh of shared consensus around man many of the points that have been made. The, the thing that I suppose I would add to that is the, the role of a new GP contract in, in, in the Sort of landscape of trying to help to to find a way forward and, and that that's around about creating a, a model for GPs to to become an attractive profession for GPs to 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 come to and to stay in in Scotland to be clear exactly what the role needs to be for GPs going forward and and, and to establish how they're going to work within that wider general practice and, and primary care team so I, I I think all of the other points are absolutely right and I think there's there is a a real need to to make this work and, and to, to to pull off a, a different version of a, a GP model for the future as well. Yes, uh, I mean, some 30 years ago, I served on a, on a health board, and I remember the number one strategy was to shift services from acute to community services. So, uh, as they say, there's nothing new uh, in politics that the same issues come round. And I think the reasons for, for, for not making as much progress uh, as we probably want to are probably twofold. One is you need to have the community services in place to do that, and we have a, have a real problem there, not just in terms of NHS primary care, care and community services but also particularly in the in the social care sector which is a unlike the NHS is a highly fragmented um, service for which um, you know if we think the vacancy rates are high in the NHS you want to see what they are in social care at the moment the sort of turnover rates we're getting people are just not attracted to work in the sector and 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 it's a very fragmented in terms of employment etc and the second issue uh, is is largely political um, you know try closing a hospital um, it's not easy. Your post bags are all full to the to the brim every time you have to make that that shift. So, you know what you've got to do is convince people that there are credible services in place, and then we have to have that dialogue with communities about the best way of using. Them. I, I would reiterate the point about bringing communities with you. Um, doctors are evidence driven, 
And if we make the arguments evidence-driven and we give uh, those that have the responsibility for dealing with community transfer the leadership skills to be confident in saying the evidence is there that the services that are being transferred are being transferred safely and you're not going to be in a position where the services delivered in the community are different. They're different, but they're not going to be poorer. Um, from our perspective, one of the challenges with the lack of transition funding, which I think was mentioned by several people in the previous um, evidence session was to make sure that these services are available in the community to prevent multiple admission or readmission from people who've had some care in a hospital sector been transferred to their college in the community and there's been a problem because the community services are not yet sufficiently well established to prevent their readmission to hospital and that's not a reflection on the ability of our colleagues in the community it's a reflection on the investment in the services that are there at the present time thank you okay. Can I ask just one slightly narrower question in terms of bringing the community with us? Your submission um, mentions this line, care should be taken with technological or pharmaceutical developments which deliver small benefits. And I think that um, one sentence there um, sort of distills down that tension between, um, you know, around evidence-based medicine, which undoubtedly favours pharmaceutical interventions um, and there aren't necessarily the same levels of evidence about some of the other interventions that might be there. Is it time for a national conversation with the public about um, some of these very expensive drugs coming along which deliver very marginal benefits? very high expectations of pharmaceutical driven care and where the evidence is there to support them then indeed people would expect to have access to those therapies. Um, there is significantly less evidence about other areas of care and that's where we need to put our emphasis. We need to encourage and support research into some of these other interventions to be clear that if there is evidence in support of them then that's the direction of travel that policymakers should be going. But in the absence of evidence we're, we're experimenting. And I don't think that's anything that we would want to endorse. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, convener, and thank you to the panel. I just want to explore a little bit more about uh, the need for, for disinvestment. Um, I've heard from the panel here talking about shifting of care and resources to communities. So I wonder whether um, you would agree that there is a need to identify areas for disinvestment and how this can be best approached. This is obviously a very difficult area um, because I if people, it's no, no, <laughs> and I'm giving myself time to think. No, I, um, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's been, I think some of the issues that we're starting to tackle about realistic medicine start to get to, to grips with this, um, that I think that our CMO is correct in challenging us about actually are the treatments that we're suggesting actually what people are really wanting and needing. Um, now that comes from some very difficult conversations um, and um, it needs to have that sort of continuity of care that GPs often need to, but we need to be well linked up with our hospital colleagues um, to, to be able to make those decisions. There's nothing worse than us having complex decisions about someone's end of life care, heading off to an oncology clinic and getting a very different message without necessarily the benefit of the discussion that we've had. Somehow we need to to cross those borders. But I'm well aware that actually those individual decisions don't lead to quick disinvestment decisions further down the track. I think that's more difficult. I think we've got to be extremely careful about how we um, tackle some of the, the preventative care agendas that some of the screening um, is now coming under question about how much benefit and what cost are we going to, to get from that. Um, that, that we're beginning to have increasing issues about overdiagnosis and overtreatment, um, which are causing us a great deal of concern. And I think it's quite cl clear that even our profession hasn't quite got a head around what the answer might be to that. But I think, and, uh, you, I think, you, I think actually, when it comes down to it, this needs to be a decision where the public's involved with as well. Although these decisions are very difficult, um, the issues about what we would personally go for for screening compared to what one would suggest for. Um, for a population can be quite conflicting sometimes. So your question was how, how to approach the, this challenge and, and 
th there are a number of different dimensions to this, I think. We, w without question, what, what we are all saying is that in order to release the kind of additional resources and investment that we need to support transformation and, and delivery of services into the future, we need to find ways of not only doing some things differently, looking at additional funds being available, we also need to think about stopping doing things as well. And that's, that's the territory in we're, that we're in here. And, and when we've explored this, there, there are a number of things I think that we do need to look really seriously at and, and the, the culture that we have of establishing targets to be achieved I think is, is something which we've all recognised requires review that we're still awaiting the outcome of, of a review on that but I think there is potential territory in there in terms of understanding what, what the drivers are that are created by targets that we set and, and exploring whether or not in fact these are the right ones or whether they, where they are directing activity perhaps in the way that's not best in the best interests of patients and in, indeed in, in the best way of spending resources. The, the other thing I think Miles has touched on this is around about the expectation of, of public and, and patients about what they would have access to and what might be best for them and I think we're all clear that being able to have a more open and honest discussion with the public about what is evidence-based and, and best for, for their individual circumstances is, is likely not only to produce better quality care for them but ultimately result in, in, in savings and, and stopping providing particular interventions in, in certain cases as well. Uh, Elaine? Um, I think my point is, is, I don't disagree with anything our colleagues have said already, but if I draw your attention to the timeline differences in investment in prevention versus investment in repair, and the, that we have called for increased investment in preventative activities, where you're not going to see the benefit of that for some years down the line, and therefore the disinvestment that will, will, will arise will be naturally delayed. In addition to that, if you look at the inequalities agenda, um, patients from more economically deprived communities make much higher use of unscheduled care services than others. And if we can address investment into there as well, so a combination of addressing inequalities, addressing deprivation and addressing prevention will help us reduce the burden on the acute hospital and scheduled care services, or indeed our colleagues in general practice who take a, 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 an even larger share of that unscheduled care work. So disinvestment may not sit in a nice time zone with investment. Uh, I know that's not what you want to hear, but it's a point I think is important to remember. Rachel. Building on, I think, what a lot of colleagues have said, and, and we've been in many conversations over the last three or four years about what sustainability in health and then in health and social care could look like. Um, and the RCN published a couple of years ago a piece of work on rethinking targets, specifically from conversations we've been having with colleagues um, around how we define very clearly what it is that we're looking for. And building on that uh, uh, last year, we put forward a proposal that we should be developing very clear criteria for change and that we need to do those really transparently because we are in a place at the moment where we have the double whammy you were really hearing about earlier on um, uh, where there is significant uh, holes in finance at the same time as people are being asked to be radically creative and to rethink. And we have to remember, going back to my point that the NHS, like social care, is a people economy. There are people at the heart of this who are trying to do both. It's not just we're moving figures around on a, on a spreadsheet. We had an event uh, last week where we were talking about the really big transformation agenda that we have at the moment. And someone reminded me of a, of a graph that I hadn't seen for quite some time. And I went and dug it out. It was in the 2011 spending review, which was this. I don't know if anyone remembers this particular graph with the great big red hole. And really, this is where we are at the moment. We're really down at the bottom of this red, and it feels like it in the service. And it will feel like it to some patients as well. Headlines this morning from uh, the BBC were, 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 were highlighting that as well. So I agree there has to be a real engagement about this. It can't just be about those of us who work in policy making decisions. It can't just be about politicians making decisions. It can't just be about communities making decisions or indeed staff. And that we haven't spoken about. Staff engagement in change is absolutely key. It has to be all of us together because there's no doubt there are going to have to be some very brave choices to be made in how we reframe things to make sure that we are delivering the very best outcomes. And that kept coming up this morning and we would support that absolutely for the people of Scotland and the resources that we choose to make available. 
to our health and social care service. So criteria we think would be really helpful in helping us assess not only whether change is fitting with policy direction, is fitting with where we say we want our society to go and has the support of the people both receiving and delivering services, but would also go back to some of the comments that I Ivan was making earlier about evaluation. Those criteria would help us to evaluate, are we making the right choices? You're right, the medicines are easier and have traditionally been easier to evaluate than many other things. On that basis where we are making decisions about how to invest in long-term change, we do need to know that we can come back at some point and evaluate whether that change has been the right investment. So I think all of those things do come together really clearly, and there's clearly a step change that we need to make there. Um, in the previous panel, we spoke about transitional change. Um, a nod off the head will do for this one, if you don't mind. <laughs> Are you all in agreement that unless we have money put in for that transition period from uh, acute into the community, then it's impossible to deliver that on the scale that we need? Miles? I'd add one more bit about that. It's not just about transformation. It's actually about better. It's not just about new systems. It's about better, um, better ways of working, um, particularly to do with improving the interface of care. This is a particular issue that um, my college has taken on, um, and I'm really grateful for the support we've had from the Scottish Government and from the Academy of Scottish um, Royal Colleges and Faculties. Um, because we believe that it's not just a matter as we can change the organisational structures, but actually we tend to see the same people doing similar jobs, um, although I understand it may well lead to different ways of divvying up budgets. But actually the key thing, is, both from a patient's point of view, is how we all behave. Um, it's absolutely crucial that I've got really good um, experts, obviously specialist clinical decision support from hospitals, and also just as important that I'm able to del deliver that to the rest of the primary care team and the present time to get it from them too, and that system is not necessarily functioning. Miles, you want to? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Karina. Um, I wanted um, to specifically look at um, what you had raised around people economy, and I think we're all acutely aware of that and some of the problems our health service faces with recruitment. Um, to what extent do you think that is preventing the IJBs and actually progress being made to move to a community setting? the fact that we've not had a workforce plan until recently. And do you think that plan is actually going to solve the problems we're facing? Yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of work, and we're pleased there's new focus on workforce planning. I think obviously you've seen the first stage of that, of, of, of that work. Um, I think it would, be, it would be fair to say, and it's not disparaging it, because the, the first stage is obviously on the NHS, which is probably the easiest one where there is at least well-established uh, workforce planning arrangements uh, are there. And it would be fair to say that the, the proposals are largely around process. So you know, what they do is they set up systems to do workforce planning rather than actually come to the to, to the to the solutions uh, I think the next stage um, uh, obviously the third one is is more in miles there but certainly the second stage in the social care area is going to be much more difficult even in process uh, for the reasons I indicated earlier we're talking about a hugely fragmented workforce yet yeah, we're talking well over a thousand adult care providers up to seven thousand in total for a country of you know five million people that's a hugely fragmented to try and and we don't have the institutions um, all the frameworks at the moment. We have ad hoc ones that we try and sort these things out, but we really do need to have some sort of framework to deal with that. The challenges, um, yeah, I think we set out, and I've, I've referenced our, our submission in, in, in the documents in front of you, but I think in terms of workforce planning, all of the ones are there. Obviously, yeah, pay is, is an issue. You'd not be surprised to hear, hear us say. Um, you know, there, are, there are huge issues in terms of, uh, of people not coming into the service, both in the NHS and, uh, and more broadly. You know, when you've had a 16 to 17 percent uh, real terms pay cut over, over a period of six years, then that's doesn't make these services as attractive as, as they should be. I think in workforce planning terms, we do need to pay more attention to issues like Brexit, um, particularly in the private and the and the and the community sector. There's a very big um, uh, use of, of EU nationals, uh, and frankly, they are not registering, uh, and others are just leaving. I was talking to a group of our members the other day who said, you know, I, and actually a firm in uh, a French firm that's actually been holding an event in Glasgow, uh, and some of them have been at it 
uh, uh, to, to give you an indication. And also big and much more difficult issues. I've just flagged one up, gender segregation. Uh, you know, in the care sector, we have uh, you know, ingrained over many years gender segregation. If you look at where the new jobs are in Scotland, we have essentially got to attract young men in, in particular into, into the care field, and that's simply not happening at, at the moment. I'd also flag up concerns, it's, I didn't um, particularly pick up the last one, but there are issues concerned in the sector about safe staffing. There are concerns about litigation, which is something we didn't talk about. Um, there's also regulation, uh, particularly growing into the social care sector. And there's a concern it tends to create more caution uh, uh, around, around practice uh, and some concerns. And the last point I flag up is that we did some very detailed research uh, earlier this year uh, on the ageing workforce. Uh, now, you might not be surprised in, in the local authority area, including social care, that that's becoming a more ageing workforce because nine out of ten jobs have been lost since austerity in local government. Uh, however, we're actually seeing ageing workforce in the NHS, which is actually growing its workforce. And I think that does open some questions as to why young people in particular are not attracted to these jobs. Is it is about pay, certainly, but it's also about the demands on the job, both physically and, 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 and psychologically, and I think that's putting people off as well. So um, that's, that's about four headings. There's a lot more in our paper. Sorry, Jill, Jill first. Sorry. Okay, thanks, Rachel. So, so the, the question about workforce planning, I, I would describe the two separate sort of dimensions to this. One is thinking about how we understand the, the demand for the workforce, and the other is where is the supply going to come from. So in, in terms of the first part of that, which is, is understanding the demand, I think the, the publication of the workforce planning framework is a start in the right direction. It is, it is not a full workforce plan for the future and it couldn't possibly be at this stage. What, what we need to do is have a clear understanding of what the future health and social care delivery landscape looks like and we don't have that yet. That's something that needs to be developed following the implementation of the health and social care delivery plan and the development of the rather complicated landscape of planning documents which are being produced at the moment for regional planning, national planning, NHS board planning, integrated joint board planning, local authority planning. So that has to come together and that needs to be made sense of and then we need to understand what does that mean for the future workforce that we need and, and my colleagues have already described the complexities of what that workforce might be made up of. But only then can we then develop a map of how we get from where we are at the moment to where we need to be in the future. And I think most of us would agree we don't even know 100% for sure where we are at the moment. We don't have complete understanding of the workforce in primary care. We, we don't have figures on specialty doctors, for example. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to know where we are. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to know where we're going. And then we could start to map out how we're going to get from A to B. And, and that is what workforce planning is about. So we're a long way away from that. Once we've done that, then we can start to think about how do we attract people into these roles. And there's a huge amount of thinking that needs to be done about how we make roles in Scotland more attractive. We need to recruit people. We need to retain people. We need to be looking at the start of the journey for, for the workforce. We need to be keeping people in the middle of their careers as well. We're losing them in primary care. We're losing them in secondary care. We're really struggling to keep a lot of doctors at their end of the career. They're leaving early, and we need to find ways to address that end of career issue as well and, and the same kind of picture is playing out in the various other healthcare professions. Rachel? I mean backing up what most of my colleagues have been saying issues like pay for example clearly a, 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 a big issue in terms of recruiting and retaining people in the workforce. Going back to the issue I was talking about earlier when Marie asked her question at the beginning around complexity one of the issues that we're facing in Jill's last point <laughs> is that as people are making decisions to leave the workforce and to leave early, and we have a huge retiral issue in nursing, particularly in community nursing, what we end up losing is some of our most experienced nurses at a point when our complexity of healthcare required is at its greatest. And that gives us a real problem. It gives IJBs a real problem as well. And I think we also have to think through in that circumstance what the morale of the workforce is in terms of thinking retention and also how attractive that is to come into as a workforce. You'll know from our submission that we released some early findings from a, a very large survey that we completed across the UK on staffing. And um, when describing what an impact on their ability to deliver high quality care, a third 
of, of respondents in Scotland reported that not enough registered nurses and a quarter, not enough healthcare support workers. So those vacancies I was talking about earlier have a huge impact when you're expecting the rest of your workforce to pick up. And remember, when I said this is a people economy, this is an economy that people go into because they want to make a difference, because they actually want to do some good for people, because they want to work alongside people who have health needs. And actually, therefore, if you're going in and coming away every day, feeling that you're not really able to quite do what you want because the vacancies are too high, because you're too stretched, because you haven't got the resources you need, that has a direct impact on, on, on your ability to feel good about turning up to work every day. I think one of the things I would say, you know, we're in this, this, this great funnel of not having enough money, that in those situations, quality becomes an issue that's harder to hold on to when money becomes the big driver. And I would say, I, I was listening with interest, our colleagues before us talking about service redesign and cuts. And I do think we have to have, and this goes back to our criteria point, a really clear idea of when which is which. Because some service redesign are cuts and some service redesign are based in really good evidence where the impact on patient outcomes is either equal or better than what they would have had before. I think sometimes we're not always being clear on that basis. And sometimes we end up with replacement models, we end up with downgrading models, and actually that isn't a good outcome. That does not deliver good outcomes. And when finances are all, which they are at the moment, for people who are starting the year knowing they've got an eight or nine million pounds hole in their budget, that becomes a really difficult one to hold on to. So I'd go back to our call for criteria. We need criteria so that we can be transparent with the public when a service change is genuinely an improvement. I wish you would go and speak to <laughs> chief, <laughs> chief executives of health boards and ministers because we've been pursuing this for so long and there is the voice of sanity on this. Sorry, <laughs> Elaine. Um, thank you. Uh, we often talk about the valuing a world-class workforce and if Scotland's going to achieve the challenge it set itself for a significant transformation in the way in which services are delivered, we're going to need that world-class workforce across all the healthcare disciplines. But if I speak for a moment particularly about hospital doctors with, uh, who are members of our college, um, what drives them is direct patient care, it's about contributing to service development, it's about contributing to quality improvement initiatives and patient safety initiatives, to the research agenda where there are evidence gaps that are so sadly needed to achieve some of the care safely or changes safely that we've already identified. And last but by no means least, to contributing to the education and training of the next generation of doctors who are going to take over from them. So there's a real issue in workforce planning about generating enough space in the work plans of these doctors to enable them to fulfil their patient responsibilities, but also the longer term contribution towards the development of health services looking forward. And if we don't do that, we devalue the job for them. And that makes us less attractive as a health economy to retain and recruit doctors into our service. So we also said you work, you're looking at, at hospital doctors working under pressure in exactly the same way as the other professions, both in the community and in the hospital sector, are functioning. But trainees are watching them young doctors coming into the profession at first, and they're watching their senior colleagues retire early because of pressure or working in a different way, and they're starting to question, do I really want to live my life like this? If we don't stop that cycle of pressure and difficulty, then we will struggle to recruit in the future, and then we'll struggle to make the changes that we all need to make. Okay, Miles, you okay? Yeah. Uh, Colin? Oh, sorry, sorry. The, <laughs> too many miles. <laughs> too many miles, not, not many of us around. Um, I was just going to make the point that in 1996, there were 2,600 hospital consultants and 3,400 GPs. And in 2014, there were 4,500 hospital consultants and the whole time equivalent GPs had actually fallen to 3,200. Um, so I think that we have had a fail um, in the uh, workforce planning for general practice. Um, it's always obviously, obviously difficult because we're an independent contractor uh, service, um, but in a situation where um, we are tightly bound by the resources coming in to employ new GPs, it's perhaps not surprising that we're in the situation we are. And briefly about um, just uh, it's so interesting to hear comments from the, the, the social care side of things. Actually, the idea is about the G GP career flow. Actually, we'd have to think about how we recruit people into the profession, how we train them, and how we retain them right the way through the career seems to be very relevant to other parts of the, of the profession. Um, we 
pinched it from rural ideas is now seem to be mainstream for general practice. But actually, I think we really need to be careful about that. And I'm really pleased to see the progress that Scott Gems is making to, to, to in the graduate entry medical school, will be training um, doctors the right way for the future needs of, of the NHS. Colin. Thanks very much, Convener. I'm looking forward to seeing how the, the official report reflects. Uh, five members of the panel nodded uh, when, when your previous question was asked. One of the criticisms when it comes to the, the health budget is when the government are challenged about resources, it's always, often a, a defensive response. Um, it's pointed out we've got more doctors, we've got more nurses than we've ever had before. Um, and I know that frustrates a lot of organisations because the, the real debate is not how many we have, but actually is the numbers and the resources keeping up with demand. Um, uh, so how do we move that debate onto the issues from a, a budget setting process? How do we move it onto that debate about is resources meeting demand? Is there something we can do as part of the budget process to achieve that? For example, put in the budget document a figure that actually reflects how much it will cost next year for services just to stand still uh, and compare that to the actual growth and the budget itself. Is there anything we can do to actually move that debate onto, onto those issues? Jo, yeah. I would refer at least partly to my answer to the previous question about workforce planning. We, we do need to understand better what, what the sort of future demand for healthcare is going to look like. But, but it's actually not that hard to model on the basis of we know what the population is going to look like in five, ten years' time in terms of its age profile and its morbidity profile. In fact, with the population forecast that we have, we can, we can predict fairly accurately exactly where people are going to be living with various different morbidities and, and healthcare requirements. And, and on the basis of that, we, we could make reasonably good estimates of what the cost of delivering healthcare to that population would look like if we don't change anything. So I, I think there's a, a sort of really important piece of work that needs to be done, and I, and I know that Scottish Government are talking about it in the context of also thinking about workforce planning and transformation. Is it's a better understanding of how to model future demand and how to scenario plan on, on what the cost of alternative models of healthcare might look like. But that, that must inform the budget setting. We must be absolutely clear and honest about the, the cost of delivering healthcare with and without transformational change to the population that we know that we're going to have in the relatively short to medium term. Dave, yeah. yeah um, I think first a word, a word on numbers. Um, uh, every year I produce um, my my analysis of numbers, which is always different from the Scottish Government's and COSLA's and everybody else's, and we all do this exercise. Uh, and because I think people do bandy numbers around, there are statistics uh, published by through ONS. Uh, but the difficulty with an awful lot of this is these services uh, are interactive, and also there have been lots of transfers between them. So one of the reasons that the numbers don't always add up when you do it is people don't take account the transfers of staff yeah for example in in highland the big shift from local government staff into into highland health board you know is rarely taken into account when people claim uh, increased staffing levels in the in the nhs um i think also i think you know uh, I've mentioned the Christie uh, Commission before, and the Christie Commission's big things was about trying to move us away from inputs uh, and more focus on on, on outcomes. Uh, and um, yeah, there are there are some difficulties around that. But if we always focus on a thousand nurses or a thousand doctors or a thousand whatever, we're not actually focusing on where we do. So I agree that um, that a lot of this is about better better planning. Um, it's not going to produce some nice little formula. Um, which you know x over y you know to the power of two etc is going to equal equal the answer it isn't like that um, we are going to have to make judgments and of course part of that is is also the political process making big decisions about the future of care um, in in Scotland so all of that has to be focused in before we can do uh, really credible uh, workforce I think what really irritates staff at the sharp end however is that when we start talking about theoretical uh, arrangements particularly in the social care field what you get is um, oh yes we, we're going to produce 500 new care packages to do x when the staff aren't there 
you know, there are companies who will say they are offered 100 uh, care packages and they haven't got the staff. It's just simply not there to deliver that level of work. So I think we have to get all of those elements in place, but recognise that none of this is going to be have the precision which you can monitor, uh, and we are going to have to make some broad judgments about the way forward. Hey, oh, sorry, Rachel, briefly, please. I guess it's a, it's a it's to answer your question. I think there's a parallel process that that could be very practically um, looked at by committee, and that's the parallel process that we expect for the safe staffing legislation to go through. I think that will have a direct implication on this um, in the longer term, and I appreciate that's not for next year's budget because it'll be a longer process to see that in. But your point about it not just being about raw numbers, about also looking at what people are being expected to do. If you look at what that bill could be and its ability to bring into account um, determining workforce numbers, skill mix included on the basis of people's dependency, on the basis of their acuity, and to come up with a far more sophisticated answer to how many staff do we need to give good quality care and at what levels of experience, and knowledge, competence. That's the bill, I think, that as a parallel process, this committee will have a real say in, in terms of making sure that in future budgets, we can then budget according to need in terms of the NHS's biggest resource, which is its people. Okay. Uh, you want to very briefly, Colin? Just a very briefly, can I just touch on one other potential pressure on the budget, and that's the current discussions around um, GMS contract, GP contract. Can I just briefly ask, it's probably a question for, for Miles and Jill, is what... What is it you want to get from that contract? What, what what does it have to deliver, and what impact will that have on the budget? Shall I start, Miles? So fundamentally, it has to support a model of general practice which is sustainable into the future, and, and that has to be a model which attracts medical students into a career in, in, in general practice. So we, we need to develop a model for uh, the, the role of the GP through this contract, which is one which addresses the challenges of, that you've been hearing a lot about already during the course of uh, the, this, I'm now looking at the clock this morning, <laughs> about what it is which is really challenging in the work environment. We, the, the, the contract needs to be clear about what the role of GPs is, but also what the role is of the, the other staff that will work in primary care. So getting clarity about exactly what individuals in, in the different roles do and how many are required is, is part of the ongoing discussion and negotiation, as well as understanding that the other factors which make general practice unattractive at the moment for a number of people who are making their choices about their medical career. So, so additional support and investment in primary care is absolutely unquestionably a part of what's required here. More people being attracted into the profession and a model which is sustainable into the future to be able to deal with the ty types of increasing demands for care in the community that we've been talking about is, is what we're seeking to achieve. Um, I, I think those three those, those bits, bits seem to be very much in keeping with where, where, where my college would see. Um, the first thing is definitely to ensure the resources are there for a sustainable future general practice. That's without question that we need to see a reversal of the, of the falling in funding to make sure that actually it's, it's, it's a sustainable level. Um, the second thing is um, undoubtedly we're going to need to grow the GP workforce, so you're quite right that we need to attract GPs into the profession. Um, and we need to make sure that we, we, we've got enough GPs to do the work that's there. Because the transformation itself is going to need um, others working with others. Um, we're going to need to be providing support for them as well as um, other bits of work that we're doing. And the third bit is about what sort of a GP is going to be in the future. Um, and we've been clear about what we believe the core values of general practice are, which I'm sure the committee wouldn't disagree with. It's about first point of contact, it's continuity of care. Um, it's being able to coordinate the care and to provide the comprehensive care for patients. And that's what our, our patients expect. So it's on those measures that I think we should um, look at the contract in the future to see whether it's, it's achieving what we need for the future of the NHS. Okay, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rachel alluded to the news headlines this morning in a previous answer, and in those we learned that, according to an investigation by The Times, um, that 14,000 fewer operations were undertaken in the first quarter of this year than in the same time, the same period of last year. For me, that's a critical indicator of an interruption in patient flow through the health service, and there are a number of areas where that may uh, 
where we, we where we could point the finger of blame. Um, I'd be very interested in whether the panel thinks that is if that is a fundamental shortage in social care destinations for uh, patients leaving hospital, whether that's um, problems in hospital where we're not ring fencing elective surgical beds, whether that's about lack of staffing, safe staffing provision in the nursing profession, or whether that's at the very start of the journey in terms of um, the GP sector and the fact that people are having to wait longer for appointments, conditions are getting more acute, necessitating inpatient care. It's a big question, I know, and you may have different answers depending on your sphere of interest, but I'm very keen to hear those answers. Okay, we are really pressed for time now, so we need to people to be very succinct. Who would like to go first? Elaine? Um, briefly, then. Um, hospital physicians have a majority of unscheduled care workload. The balance of their workload in hospital is unscheduled and therefore is predictable in terms of pattern, but it's not work that can be scheduled or delayed in the way that the, the, the surgical procedures may have been. But also, because of... Uh, difficulties in community care and, and a lack of provision in, in community care, it sometimes has meant that physicianly patients, medical patients, have taken up resource in hospital that's prevented surgical procedures going ahead. And that's one that comes as a surprise to nobody. Um, our hospital management colleagues have had to manage that pressure. You cannot turn away a sick medical patient out of accident and emergency or from a GP surgery. And until such time as we can achieve this transformational change, that's always going to be a pressure that will cause our surgical colleagues difficulties from time to time. So I, I, I start with that. Males? Two bits. I think this is ways, um, we are concerned about the rising in waiting times, and this has a direct effect on us as patients come back to us again and again. Um, to get symptomatic treatment for while they're awaiting surgery. I think you're absolutely right about uh, saying about the downstream effects on that and unscheduled care is, is a big issue. Um, I think there is clear evidence from uh, Helen Irvin's work that actually um, failure to um, invest in primary care services, particularly GPs and district nurses, um, puts proportionate pressure um, for the elderly population um, into A&E departments, and many of those get admitted. So I think there is issues that we need to look at as a whole system. And my real concern is that if um, there are things that can be measured, and waiting times is, is one of those measurable ones, um, but inevitably we may find that we're investing in the wrong place and not actually getting to the root cause, which may well be the aspiration of this committee and of ourselves to actually build capacity in the community. Dave? Yeah, I a lot of work, actually, people obviously say, well, are the design solutions here? And actually, there's a lot of work being done in the NHS in partnership between staff and, and management in relation to improving flows in hospitals, improving design, uh, doing innovative things. There's plenty of good example of that. Um, but, you know, Clearly, there are a lot less operations being done. That certainly is down to vacancies. We've talked to you about both doctor and nurse and, and other staff vacancies in the NHS, and that simply leads to, in some cases, straightforward cancelling of, uh, of operating lists and the rest of it. Uh, and then there's the issue, obviously, people who are in hospital who shouldn't need to be there. And obviously, progress has been made in a number of those areas, uh, but that is largely down to, to social care. The reason, some, I think the first question Marie asked was, was why that... Uh, you know, why, why, why the reference goes to a hospital? The answer is hospitals don't turn people away. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, is, it is as simple as simple as that, that if you're not sure another service is there, then, then you, you refer to hospital, and hospitals have to manage that situation. I'll try and be brief and so won't, again, reiterate many of the points which I absolutely agree with. It, it, it sounds like a relatively simple question. It's a very complex answer. There are a, a range of different factors. The, the, the one that I would strengthen and, and, and add to is obviously we do have a high level of vacancies amongst consultants in, in hospitals. The, the latest figures that we've seen is 460 vacancies. That's about one in every 14 consultant posts. And of those at least half have been vacant for six months or more, and that has to have a, a significant impact on the number of operations that can be performed. Uh, finish that, yeah. Uh, Brian? Yes, yeah, thank you, Good morning, panel. Um, going back to the preventable health uh, agenda, there's an inevitable logic about shifting some resource towards uh, the preventable health. I think, that, uh, but then that there's a reluctance for that move, move to be made. I think there's around, I mean, defining what preventable health agenda actually is, because there's a lot of different, uh, different uh, ideas around that. And 
and also therefore there's, there's this almost a requiring of a leap of faith um, uh, 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 along a preventable health agenda. So how, where are we with quantifying your know, benefits both sort of financially and socially into this sort of long-term investment in preventable health? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the point was made earlier that this was um, was was flagged up, particularly in, in, in the Christie Commission report, and, and I was an advisor to, to that to that commission. And we did look at, and there were actually lots of very practical examples where you could actually even put a cost on it to show that we did this and we did that. We're probably um, not very good always at, at, at shouting um, and, and costing up the benefits to demonstrate them to people like yourselves uh, that actually it does make does make a difference. That's because. It is very complicated and frankly it takes a lot of staff time to start doing all of these things and this sort this sort of reporting so um but i think you know there is very solid evidence right across the world which says that this broader uh, preventive activity and this is why you know there's a certain frustration at times when people constantly talk about the nhs as being you know on that area when we all know that health inequalities require action in education in sport and leisure facilities and uh, uh, and housing and 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 so much else as well uh, and uh, there is a, there's one point I did want to make this morning Kavina which because it, it came after I wrote our submission but um, you know one thing I, I would urge um, the committee to look at very carefully uh, is you'll have seen the Barclay report uh, proposals on business rates um, one of those recommendations obviously is that the exclusion from for the, the trusts and their sports facilities, local authorities have largely moved their sports facilities into, into, into leisure trusts. Um, that will uh, take a big chunk of money out of sport and leisure on that basis. Now, I don't actually disagree with the technical recommendation in relation to the business rates, but if we don't put the same amount of money back into local authority budgets, we are going to see a big cut uh, in sport and leisure facilities of the sort that uh, Peter Johnson and others identified this morning. So I would urge you to, from a health perspective, uh, to put some input into whatever recommendations the, the minister might take from that particular report. Uh, Miles, yeah. I just want to, um, I was to, to talk from the uh, Scottish uh, Obesity Action in Scotland yesterday um, as part of the Scottish Academy meeting. They, they were making the point quite clearly that actually one of the issues is that it's not just about having preventative actions, but actually having preventative actions which are going to work across the society. There's no point in having something which just makes the people who are, who are the, the most wealthy and the most well-to-do and least likely to suffer real health um, to, get, to get them even fitter. We really need to bring everyone up together. This comes to the key point about continuity of care and about the role of being able to embed the preventative activity into routine treatment. So actually the GP being able to see patients with long term, understand them, understand their community, and maybe even understand their fa family petting, so we could potentially even um, inter intervene for future generations, is an ideal opportunity to get these messages across, but particularly getting these messages across in a way which is appropriate to that person who's coming to us. Because for many of them, it's um, of some of our patients who are most needy. Actually, the idea of living to their 80 or 90 seems some like, like a middle class abstraction to them. It's not something which is, is on their cards when all they're worrying about is how to pay their bills this week or how to make sure their rent's paid. So we have to work with them where they're coming from. And I think we've got a great deal to learn from the deep end um, group of practices about how we can do that and how the key role of general practice and primary care is to deliver that in the context of continuity. Okay. Rachel. I get back to the convener's question where we almost managed to only nod our heads earlier, but we did speak a little, which was about the issue of extra funding. Mm. And I guess your question came about moving funding out of essentially the acute into the community sector. And I would question whether that's actually possible in the current climate. The NHS remains quite rightly free at the point of need for those who need it. We don't turn people away in the NHS and we still have people who require acute services to be delivered. So I think simply removing money and putting it elsewhere when we know we don't have enough is, is almost going to be impossible. I think we go back to the double funding arrangement that we're going to require to make the sort of step change that we're looking for. I agree with comments that have been made throughout the morning about evaluating what that step change looks like and making sure that that investment, that new investment, goes to the right place. And one thing that we've not really touched on this morning is, is an issue that's been brought up by us and many others, which is the issue of long-term financial planning. So at the moment when you're in constant annual cycle 
uh, to break even, you don't actually allow that step change to take to, to sort of come to fruition over a number of years. And I know the Auditor General, among others, has, has talked about potential for three year planning cycles, which we believe would support a much uh, at least the beginning of a longer term approach. And finally, just to say that Health Scotland published work with ISD over the summer, which, um, I, although I don't like the title, I understand why it has the title, Burden of Disease, which I thought was some very interesting work looking at um, uh, where particular conditions in Scotland um, are having the greatest impact on our population, and they're intending to do more work to look at how to do forecasting on that basis. I would suggest in your question about prevention and where we start thinking about directing new investment, that work gives us some really interesting data to start to interrogate about are we actually getting that investment into the right places for the greatest need that we have in our communities. Yep. I refer to some of the conversation this morning in, in answer to this question because a, a number of, of people made the point very clearly that the investment that's required in order to tackle the sort of upstream health improvement and, and, and prevention agenda is largely needs the investment needs to be made outside of the health and social care budget. So if we're talking about mental health, obesity, alcohol, drugs, smoking, the majority of the interventions and the actions which need to be invested in need to be funded and resourced from beyond the health and social care budget. And, and there was some very good discussion about the implications of that. But it doesn't mean that there are not good things that can be done within the health and social care budget. And, and Miles was talking quite you know, quite quite lengthy there about uh, the role of GPs and the, and the potential they can have in terms of positive interventions at various different sort of, um, levels of the, the family life. So uh, our plea would be, yes, indeed, look at the health and social care budget in terms of being clear about what it is we can do to contribute to that prevention agenda, but the majority of it is, is definitely outside of, of health and social care. Okay, could I, could I ask a final point on pay? Um, there's been an announcement that the 1% pay cap uh, is, is going to go. Um, last year we saw the living wage introduction and then we've still got the hangover from that about sleepovers and how sleepovers money will be paid or not paid or, you know, that, and there's all sorts of machinations within that. Um, does anybody know where the 1% is, uh, the money to break the 1% is coming from? The short answer is no, um, because in fairness, there are there are a couple of um, uh, factors uh, in terms of addressing that. Obviously, one is the UK government's autumn budget, um, and obviously we we can all guess as to or uh, uh, as to how much the Chancellor uh, will jiggle his own targets to create um, what we hope is revenue spending. By the way, um, you know, the, in the past there's always been some capital monies being fed in the budget there, but actually all the things we're talking about pay in particular need revenue funding. Uh, so obviously we hope that the Chancellor at UK level uh, will free up some resources so there will be a revenue increase to the Scottish Government, which it can then use for, uh, for partly for pay. Uh, and secondly, obviously, it's the Scottish Government's own decisions about the other half of the budget that it controls in terms of what it's going to do in tax. And obviously, you know, we've heard from the First Minister there's going to be a discussion paper uh, on tax. So I think, um, obviously, our, we're very much welcome um, the statement of principle to say, that one percent cap is not not sustainable. Uh, that's really good news, and uh, and and we welcome that. Obviously, one point one isn't going to be acceptable. Uh, so we obviously want to see um, a, a real increase uh, in uh, in pay this year. If we're going to tackle some of the long-standing issues uh, in in terms of in terms of attracting people into into this. We need to do more than pay is absolutely the starting point. It's the the the, the basic starting point is sorting out all of the recruitment retention issues but then you have to do the other things around the amount of staff that they're training and so much else but I think pay is absolutely crucial to that so we hope um, the Scottish Government will have some flexibility to be able to put serious money money in health not just to tokenly increase above the one percent but uh, but certainly to start to catch up and, and make health and care in particular uh, an attractive profession for people to come into. In terms of um uh, the social care uh, living wage, some of that money had to be found internally from the system 
uh, are we likely to see that again? In, in well, I, I, I noticed the question early on, and you'll see in my submission, I have made point about double counting of uh, of of, of um, living wage monies. If it goes through the NHS, one I often say that one of our finance members said to me, "I can't spend the same pound twice, Dave." Uh, so that is a is a real issue in in relation to that. In terms of living wage, living wage is largely being 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 paid for waking day duties and, and waking night duty. Uh, we are still in discussions with government, COSLA and etc. about how we will deal with uh, waking night duty and sleeping in in particular. Uh, one of the problems that we need to recognise is that the historical use of sleeping in uh, is no longer an appropriate model in, in care. The idea that if you're on the sleeping in duty, you're going to spend the night kipping uh, in the ho and not being woken up. It just doesn't happen. So I think we're going to have to bite the bullet and recognise that the difference between sleeping in and waking night duty is now you know, pretty blurred if, if it exists at all. So Minister in Fairness has, has said that she wants to be paying the Scottish living wage for these hours. We think that's right. Uh, and there are discussions at the moment as to how we might, uh, we might get round and, and do that. Anybody else? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and we'll now move into private session. <laughs>